Hello, my name is Tim Slater. I'm from the University of Wyoming and also from the Capers Center for Astronomy and Physics Education Research. I'd like to spend some time talking with you about some of the research that people have been doing related to how people learn visually, in particular, how people learn in a planetarium environment. I work with a fantastic group of people around the world as part of the CAPER team, and we're interested in trying to figure out how it is that people best learn, and therefore, how can we, in fact, do a good job of teaching people? In reality, we don't know all the answers, but we're trying to figure these things out, and we're really trying to figure out how to best teach people who really want to learn. There are two ways to go about doing this, of course. One is theory-based. That's where we take a look at the literature over the last hundred years and the many, many experiments that have been done looking at how people learn. The other way is to do our own research or look at experiments that psychologists do where they quite literally take two groups of people, put them in two different situations, and try to figure out in which case, if either, do they learn better. And it's these experimental designs that I'd like to talk to you about today. I mean, we could do this all theoretical, but as our colleague Mike Bennett likes to say, if you're thinking about the difference between theory and practice, there's only one difference. In theory, there's no difference at all. Of course, in practice, there is. So let's consider um, some visuals that people might be showing in a planetarium environment, or be showing in a lecture classroom, or be showing in a textbook, like the Investigating Astronomy textbook. Here's an image that's pretty commonly found when people are trying to explain the phases of the moon. Now, for an expert, somebody who already understands the phases of the moon, this is a great diagram. It makes a lot of sense. It demonstrates in each case that the moon, no matter where it is, is one half lit by the sun, and one half unlit by the sun. And when you're standing on the earth, depending on where you are on the earth, if you're on the sunlit side, it's daytime. If you're on the nighttime side, the dark side, it's nighttime. And depending on where you are on the Earth and where the moon is in its orbit around the Earth, you can see different portions of the lit moon. At some places you see just a sl small slender crescent, a very small amount of the lit side of the moon. In other cases, you see the entire lit side of the moon, where it appears big and full. Now, for someone trained in this, that diagram explains everything perfectly. But let's suppose you're a brand new student, someone who doesn't know much about moon phases, or worse yet, thinks they know a lot about moon phases, but have some pretty serious misconceptions. This diagram could be really confusing. In fact, it is. There's not just one moon in this diagram. In fact, it looks to me like there are seven moons. Well, wait a minute. Maybe not just seven. Maybe there are actually eight moons or 15 moons and all kinds of different, different places and looking different. This diagram could be pretty confusing. Are there ways to make it easier? Yes. And research tells us exactly what those ways are. Now, you might say, well, you know, in a planetarium, we can really take advantage of the fact that we can act, act, use motion, that we can uh, look at videos rather than just static images. And absolutely, that's true. Um, take a look at this image for a minute here. It's something we see in a lot of planetariums. This is using real data to demonstrate how the moon changes its appearance over the course of the moon. In fact, it shows a lot of information. It shows the names of all the major craters. It shows the uh, lighter highlands areas. It shows the darker Maria areas. It shows quite a bit of stuff. It shows where the moon is in its orbit in the top left-hand corner. And interestingly enough, it even shows the libration that the moon seems to wobble in its orbit a bit as it's going around the Earth, using Earth as a central reference point. Makes us wonder if this is better or maybe it's just more stuff. Fortunately, with educational research, we can actually answer these questions by looking at groups of students, putting them in different settings, giving them different information, and then testing what it is that they know. Now, we can't just throw them in there and start asking questions. Um, we actually have to have research questions ourselves. One research question we might pose is, well, if we all know that a picture is worth a thousand words, could we make a picture worth 10,000 words? How about if we're very careful about it? Can we make it worth 100,000 words or even a million words? Or we might ask the question, if we take a beautiful visualization designed for the planetarium or for the classroom, and if we add text and arrows in there and maybe even some bubbled text, does that increase students' understanding? Or we could even say, 
Well, let's suppose for all of our work, we add closed captioning, little words across the bottom of the screen to reproduce what the narrator is saying. Does that help? Or maybe when we put a picture up, maybe instead of having a lot more information, maybe we should just stop talking. Which of these things work? Well, if you have competing educational interventions, you can imagine experiments where you take two different groups of learners and give them both settings and see what works. Now, to be truthful, a lot of this work has not been done in a planetarium. But this work has been done by experimental psychologists. Now, you might say, well, why is it being done by experimental psychologists and not by planetarium educators? And in general, that's because experimental psychologists at the university setting have access to thousands and thousands of students who need to earn credit by participating in controlled group studies, whereas planetarium operators are often busy running a planetarium. But we don't have any reason to believe that the things that we know about learning in a psychology setting would be any different than what happens in a planetarium setting but it could be interesting to find out. Let's take a look at some of these. <coughs> the research I'd like to share with you is that done by a friend of mine by the name of Rich Meyer. Uh, Rich is at uh, UC Santa Barbara. He's been doing this research for a very long time, and he's uh, most notably done, known for his work um, related to multimedia education, and he loves two-group experimentation. So let me share with you some of his work just ever so briefly and think about how it might apply in a planetarium learning environment or even an astronomy classroom environment. But to do that, I need to explain the theoretical lens that we're looking at this through. There are a lot of ways to think about this work, but it's probably easiest if we think about it in terms of a sandbox where we've got four walls to a sandbox that we're trying to constrain the different ways we can think about this. So if we think about the four walls to what we're working on here, um, one is our desired outcomes. Just what is it we want students to learn and leave with? How is it we want students to be different when they exit an astronomy learning environment? Uh, one case, maybe we just want them to know a long list of names and a long list of ideas, a lot of factual knowledge. Or maybe we want more than that. Maybe we want them to understand big concepts and how these concepts transcend different, different domains of astronomy. Maybe we want them to be able to think about how the things they're learning astronomy might, might relate to other fields of science, or maybe even their own lives, culture, news. So in addition to framing exactly what we want students to know, we also need to talk about what evidence that we're going to accept. Are we going to accept evidence that requires experimentation, the experimentation that requires two groups of students, group number one and group number two? Maybe those that have been to the planetarium and those haven't. Or can we just look at their incoming students' incoming state, give them a learning experience, and see how they're different when they leave the planetarium or leave the classroom? Or which theoretical underpinnings are we using here? What is it that we believe about how students learn that drives the research questions we're doing? Those are two very different sides of a research framework. To constrain us even more, we have to figure out what our assumptions are. One of the assumptions that we make today that we didn't make 30 years ago is that in our side of, our, of the human brain, where we process verbal information, oration, lectures, narration, and where we process visual information actually happens in two different parts of the brain. We also make as an assumption that as humans, we can't take in absolutely every piece of information that's thrown at us. Rather, there's a limited amount of capacity for input. And finally, the assumption we make is that in order to learn, in order to take in information, the student actually has to be an active participant in what's going on, to be thinking about it, to be open to receiving information, not just passively sitting. And then finally, to round out our framework, our, our sandbox, if you will, we want to know which demands are we looking at, which cognitive demands, which things that are taxing our brain. And essentially there are three that I'd like to share with you today. The first one is what we call extraneous processing. You're sitting in a planetarium, you're sitting in a classroom environment, there's all kinds of things going on. There's music, there's lights, there's the person you're sitting next to, there's the, uh, the, the temperature of the room. All those are extraneous processing pieces that the brain has to manage. Then there's also essential processing. That's the part of the brain that's just trying to take in information and trying to decide what's important and what's not important. And trying to associate names with concepts or vocabulary with things they already know. And finally, there's generative processing. That's the brain's capacity to actually make connections in their head and to really develop a deep understanding. 
to begin to ask questions of the data and the information that's being presented to them. All right, that frames where we're going. We could go some other direction, certainly, but this limits the amount of things we want to talk about here. And so let's jump right in. Let's first talk about this extraneous processing, this process where students are trying to figure out of all the information that's coming in, what's most important. To do this, I have an image. It's a standard textbook image. I've also seen it shown in planetariums that's trying to describe the different aspects of Stonehenge. Now, if you're wanting to teach your students about Stonehenge, and maybe you're going to spend two or three minutes talking about maybe you're going to spend 15 minutes talking about Stonehenge. What's really important? As we look at this diagram, we see quite a bit of information. We've got the the rising and setting positions of, of the sun in the winter time. We've got the, the uh, sunset position for the summertime. We also have the directions north. Fortunately, this diagram also provides for us the heel stones, uh, the places where you can find chalk blanks. Even the Aubrey holes are listed here, as well as the dates that show this was completed in about 1550 BC. That's a lot of information. Is that what you want students to know five minutes after they leave your planetarium, five months after they leave your classroom? five years later, what we do know is that people don't know what to pay attention to. They need some sort of coherence. And what we find is that if you figure out exactly what you want people to know and remove everything else, that students learn better. Now, I, I should point out here, we're talking about students, we're talking about people that have a general interest in science, general interest in astronomy, but may not be dedicated to learning astronomy or spent the same number of 10, 15, 30 years that many of you have spent. So we're talking about people. We're not talking about you. We're talking about people that just wander into your planetarium or take your introductory astronomy class. And what we do know is that there's only so much information that people can take in. And it turns out to be a whole lot less than most of us think. Let's take an example from astronomy. We're thinking about reducing the amount of extraneous information here. Um, one of the things we do know when we put students in different groups and we give them information, we know that if they get extra, extra words, extra pictures, extra sounds, that they don't know what to pay attention to. Um, so, for example, we think about Tycho Brahe. <laughs> Lots of good stories about Tycho Brahe, right? Yes, a Danish nobleman um, of quite a bit of wealth, made some amazing observations, uh, had a beautiful uh, observatory there at Uraniburg, um, also was an interesting fellow. As he, many of us know, he lost his nose in a duel. He had a fake nose that he wore. He's a fantastic observer um, up until his time. Nobody could make as accurate measurements and record them as in much detail as he had. In fact, he'd come up with his own model of the solar system that was a hybrid model of the geocentric model and the, uh, the heliocentric model. And, of course, we know he did die of a very unfortunate death having to do with, with bladder failure. That's a lot of information. Do you want students to know all of those things when they leave your planetarium? It only took me 40 seconds to rattle off that information. What we do know is that if you can ex remove the extraneous words, the extraneous pictures, the extraneous sounds, that students can remember better. Because of that long story, they're probably going to remember that the man had no nose, rather than remember the things that we want him to, rem to remember about him, is that he played a very important role in history. Now, of course, there's been a lot of research on this. We look just at this coherence principle, the idea of providing too much information. Um, here's 12 different studies um, showing an effect size of 1.13. That's a huge effect size. So even very simple experiments in your planetarium or your learning environment um, would confirm something that's this, this noisy. Well, in addition to uh, thinking about the coherence, what we call the coherence principle, if we're trying to reduce the amount of extraneous noise that's coming in to students, we have something called the signaling principle. And that tells us that students know, are able to learn better if you call their attention to the really important parts. So, for example, here's an image here that's used often when we're trying to describe the nature of global warming and uh, global climate change. And there's a lot of stuff going on here, and it is all accurate, but it's too much. One of the things we know is if we can take that diagram and we can turn it to grayscale and just only have the part we really like them to pay attention to in color, that students can actually retain that information that's in color better. It helps them reduce the amount of noise that's there. And we know that when we do that in a number of different studies, um, that consistently is a very high effect size when doing group comparisons. Let's consider another strategy that we know from research about how to reduce extraneous processing. Um, and one is called the redundancy principle. 
Many of you um, work in environments where you provide closed captioning. Here's a short video clip um, about uh, using some closed captioning. And you may be asking the question, should I be using closed captioning? Look around, Miss Donovan. Do you sense anything? Hunger? I think there's a falafel place. Pay on. attention. Look beyond what you see. Now, my children and I often have this discussion at home when we're watching TV. Should we turn on the closed captioning or not? Does it help you understand the story better if there's closed captioning? Now, from a straight research perspective, what we know, you can imagine the experiment. Take two groups of learners. In one case, show them a video without the, the narration. In another case, show them the video with the narration. What we find is consistently, again and again, is that when you add the closed captioning, the on-screen text, people learn less. Now, I know if you work at a planetarium, you're thinking, wait a minute, I've got students in there who have difficulty hearing, I have students in there with all sorts of handicaps, um, and I think that that really helps. Yes, in a planetarium environment, you have to make those decisions. But you need to understand that if you make the decision to add captioning, you may be helping some students but you're hurting others because it's just too much information. And that research bears out again and again consistently. Um, here's uh, nine different studies that were done um, talking about when you get put on uh, text information with the video that students actually learn less. And again, it's a very strong effect size to this. Well, we're almost done talking about re reducing extraneous processing, but there's one more piece that I'd like to talk about, and that has to do with temporal, what we call the temporal continuity, continuity, <laughs> continuity principle. And that has to do with um, how information is provided. Sometimes when we're showing a video clip, the sound is aligned with the video. Other times, it's not. So let's take a look here at a short Clone Wars clip. anywhere near that. Come now. What happened to all the enthusiasm I saw earlier? Don't worry about us. You just make sure you get yourself to that landing zone in one piece. Yes. I shall be waiting for you when you finally arrive. Gentlemen, if you are quite finished, we have a battle. So if you could tell from the video, one of the things that you notice here is that the sound, the narration, um, doesn't match the lip movements of the, of the actors that are here. So when you're putting a video up on your, in your classroom or showing in the, in the planetarium, you may wonder if that's a big deal or not. Turns out it's an easy thing to test. You should take one group of students and you show them with the sound aligned with the pictures. In other places, you show them sounds not aligned with the pictures. And you say, is it a big deal? And it turns out the answer is yes, from a research perspective, quite a bit. And it has, I think also has to do with where we put information. So here's a very common textbook image talking about um, the nature of gravitational attraction related to stars of different sizes. Um, and here there's a caption listed below here from a very famous textbook called Investigating Astronomy. And it's all scientifically accurate. Um, there's a caption for figure A, a caption for figure B, a caption for figure C, a caption for figure D. And I suspect you've even stopped trying to look at it at this point. And I promise you students have too. If you can put information close to its pictures, students can learn a lot more. Adding these cartoon bubble sheets um, has a tremendous impact on student retention when they're looking at graphics, either the kinds of things that you're showing in the planetarium dome, the kinds of things you're showing in the classroom, maybe posters that you have um, outside your teaching environment. And again, putting words close to what's important, it doesn't just seem like a good idea. It has a very, very strong effect size when we look at this. All right, up to this point, we've been doing a very quick survey about how do we manage extraneous processing for students? How do we help them learn more by cutting out extra information? Things that we think are cool sometimes, but really are distracting. But what about essential processing going on in the brain? Now we're talking about really trying to learn names and learn facts and make connections between the two of them, really doing the essential part. And there are three things that we have to manage. One has to do with what we call the segmenting principle. We talked about how this image here is so much better than putting a caption way off to the side. Turns out we can improve this many times over by taking this image, cutting it up into small pieces, and providing students with just information about a large star, like a supergiant star. And then what about a smaller star, like a neutron star? Or in talking about how when this neutron star gets even smaller, um, how that changes the, the uh, 
in this case the field lines for gravitational attraction, or a black hole. By segmenting this information, we can dramatically increase the amount of information students take away. And again, this shows up in research again and again with a strong effect size. But it's not just segmenting that's important. We also know that pre-training students can really help as well. So here's a diagram, again, from a very common textbook. And there's a lot of information on here. We can help students process this information not only by segmenting it, but also by giving them an overview about what they're seeing. So, for example, in this image here, um, we've got the sun. The sun's a nearby star, just like many of the other stars. Here's an image of a galaxy. You've seen a lot of these pictures before. A galaxy is not just a single star, but is hundreds of millions, if not hundreds of billions of stars. Um, there are also clouds of gas floating around in outer space. Um, and if we put all these things together, we get the universe. Now that we kind of have some basic terms, let's go back and look at this in more detail. Is a teaching strategy called the pre-training principle that helps students focus again on what's more, most important and helps them retain better. And using pre-training, getting students the vocabulary out first, um, really helps in a lot of different scenarios. Also related to this, we have something which we call the modality principle. The modality principle says that if you have students looking at graphics and we have narrations from the graphics, that you can actually test, is it better to have the graphics next to it? Or is it better to have the graphics alone with a narrator just speaking it to them? Think about that for a second. Would you learn better about this particular image if you have text next to the graphic, or you had just the graphic with narration going on? This research, again, is pretty clear. It turns out that if you have the graphic next to it, students learn less than a situation where students are just looking at the graphic and having um, narration. The on-screen text takes up more of students' uh, cognitive processing abilities. And this shows up again and again and again. Um, this, one of the things that uh, Rich Mayer has done the most research on is trying to understand just how much information you can put in a multimedia setting. Turns out, not very much. Pictures are worth a thousand words, but you reduce that thousand words if you add words to your picture. Another one of Mayer's principles is also something called the multimedia principle. And again, it's focused on this idea of managing students' essential processing skills, trying to help students know what's most important and helping them learn that information. So here we have two possible scenarios. We have text on the left, about stars and about the onion shell that occurs when we have different, uh, different shells, and a picture on the right which is very few words. We can very quickly ask the question, do the experiment. Do students learn more from text or from pictures? Uh, you're going to know the answer to this one. Of course, they do learn more from pictures. But what about just the way the words? Suppose you're not using pictures at all. We can test that too. When we're talking about genitive processing, really trying to have students internalize the ideas, make connections with other things they know. You can give text in two different ways, either as narration or as printed text. You can say, when astronomers look at starlight that's been separated into its wavelengths, or you could say, hey, when you look at starlight separated into its constituent wavelengths, you might wonder if there's a difference in what students learn. I mean, astronomers looking or you looking, it seems like that might not make a big difference. But it does. When you're able to personalize things, when you use the word you rather than astronomers, students, in fact, do learn more. And this has shown up again and again in a variety of, of many different studies. So start thinking about the planetarium shows you're giving or the ways you may describe things to students. Personalization, using informal language, really does make a measurable difference. Again, we're talking now about generative processing, trying to get students to internalize and identify with the information and make connections across things that they already know. One very common strategy um, is to give quotes. And you might imagine um, having a situation in, in a classroom or a situation in a planetarium where you put up a quote and you put up an image of the person who's, who's made that quote. Um, something that we use when we're doing NASA education a lot because NASA likes to uh, take time and energy to demonstrate that all science is not done by white males, but there are active females, there are young astronomers, there are people of all different ethnicities, um, all different states of handicap, all different ages, all different heights for that matter. Um, and so often they'll add images, um, still images, um, to these things, uh, to these quotes to really try to make it better. Turns out you can do the research. You can imagine the research project, right? So here's a quote, and here's a quote with a picture. In which case do students learn more? This isn't so clear, but often 
students remember more about the picture than they do about the quote. Now, you can use that to your advantage, but if you're just trying to get students to understand the quotes better by adding a picture, research shows that that doesn't work. In fact, this gets really complicated, particularly in settings like the one we're in right now. Should my image be here as part of what's going on? Here's a picture of Stephanie Slater teaching an online course for the Sophia mission, um, looking at uh, you know, the three-dimensionality of space. We've got images of her. We've got images of her students that are there. Um, here's a, a, a video a chat going on. Where we're doing some remote observing where we're looking at some galaxies. You can see me in the observatory. You can see some other um, scientists from around the world. We're all working on the same telescope, which is not located where we were. Does that image help? Turns out, no, not necessarily. Now, what about the narration that you might be using in the planetarium? I guess many of you do live planetarium shows, but what about when you have pre-recorded planetarium shows? Um, should you be using a mechanical voice or should you be using a human voice? So here's an example Hello. of a human voice. Hello. My systems and functions are fully operational. Face and voice recognition are activated. Waiting for facial recognition identification. Does this help? We've got a, a more human voice. We've got something that's a, a more human look. Does that work better than having a mechanical voice? We can actually do that experiment. Turns out, in fact, that students do learn more um, from a more of a human sounding voice. So you may say, okay, no more computer generated voices in my class. But wait a minute. That determine the evolution of the universe given its state over all space at one time. And second, there was no question of the initial state of the universe. There's a mechanical voice, a very, very famous mechanical voice. Should you use that mechanical voice in your planetarium? Turns out no. If you want your students to learn more, and you can do the experiment, it's been done many times, though not done in a planetarium, should students hear the mechanical voice or a human voice? Turns out, from a research perspective, they should hear the human voice. Now, you're going to say, wait a minute, wait. this is a very famous mechanical voice, and I agree with you, and students should be, uh, should be exposed to it. Well, that's right. But if this goes on for more than a couple of minutes, you're actually reducing the amount, of stu amount that students can learn. How do you get around that? The way people get around this is they'll show 15 or 20 seconds of the mechanical voice, and then that mechanical voice will fade into a narrator, which has um, a more human voice, we hope most narrators have human voices, has a more human voice who will continue on with the transcript. I beg you, do not do a 40-minute program that all has Stephen Hawking doing all the talking, because students will learn less. As much as I love the mechanical voice, remember, people that come to our planetarium aren't motivated by the same things that we are, don't have the same understanding that we do, um, and you need to think about what's best for them. Um, by the way, the research is also pretty clear on this, and it's an easy experiment to do. Um, although it's not been done in the planetarium environment, it has been done in the, a controlled psychology environment. We see very strong effect sizes. The human voices work better than mechanical voices. So if we look at these overall, if we're just talking about Mayer's uh, research here, we find consistently that you can engineer a multimedia presentation in a planetarium perhaps even in a classroom, so that students do in fact learn more. But what's important here is that you scaffold your video visuals because you've got to worry about extraneous processing. That's students don't know what to pay attention to, so you've got to show them what's most important. There's essential processing, and that is being sure that students are paying attention to what's most important, not just being distracted, but you tell them what's most important. And then there's generative processing issues where students are trying to make connections between what they know, what they're learning, and what they've already learned. And those involve things being very personal to them. So we're talking about having human voices. We're talking about using the words you rather than saying astronomers see or scientists see if we want to make some real differences.